words are power. Words communicate. And so we're not trying to find words to make us look smart because most of us are dumb and we need to recognize that. And the only way that we become smart is by tapping into the Spirit who will give us words. But God, but there has to be some commitment. I have a, a thing that I received. It's called Word for a Day that comes from Webster. Every day it comes into my, my email box with all of the other spam and crap and stuff from that outer world there. But... It's like there will be a word, it'll be, and it'll give its definition, it'll give it a use in uh, literature, and give it a use in... So it's kind of building into my fabric of who I am some vocabulary that will help me. Because there's nothing more frustrating in the world. Here's another thing that used to happen to me. I would get this revelation. And you know how, how revelation in your mind is so clear, man? It's so, it's so powerful. You see something, it's like, holy cow. I wonder if anybody's ever seen this. So I'll go to Mickey and I'll say, I got a revelation. That's the last thing she wants to hear from me. It's like, okay, well, whatever, you know. So, and then I will try to explain the revelation, and there's no words to explain it. Am I, if there's anybody ever, I, maybe I'm just the only one. It's just like, it's like, it's clear. You see this thing. It's the most amazing thing in the world, and you... Try to explain it's like, well, it's like, I, it's like a cloud in the sun. It's like, uh, it's like a conundrum, you know, that's <laughs> kind of ubiquitously everywhere. You can't see it or understand it. It's a mystery. It's a puzzle. It's, but, but so words are important for us to be able to describe the things that we have seen. Because for the writer, you see something before you speak something. That's what Revelation is. You know, in the book of Revelation, it says, the angel comes to John, what's it says? The things which you have seen, write, and put in a book. So we see things before we can write things. Sometimes the problem is people write and they haven't seen anything, and those are really bad books, and they get rejected by publishers. But what was that about? What was I talking about? So the words, so the power of words, so verbal advantage, word a day. The second thing is, is by reading books. And I am an avid reader. I, I'm surprised how few people in our day don't read anymore. It is a great shame of the culture that we live in. And these little things right here in my pocket, these things here, Oh, I missed call. Uh, they have taken over our life, you know, Xbox and all. And, and so we live in a visual world, but we don't live in a word world. And words have a way of doing things to you. And, you know, in the, our industry, they have ebooks now. So they have the thing called the Kindle Reader. So, John, our. Uh, technician guy at DI, so he says, take this Kindle on the road for a week and see what you like. And it's kind of a cool thing, you know, you can kind of, you know, push buttons and the page flips and you can highlight things in yellow and it's like, oh, how do you get that? And it's like, I took it back, John says, no, this is not going to work for me. It might work, you know, for the next generation. What I need is, I need a book so I can write here in the corner and I can highlight and and, and I, can, I, I need to feel this. My eyes need to be able to see it. I need to taste and handle. Uh, but there's something about the power of books. And I, when I was in Bible college, this must be like confession day or something. <laughs> but uh, liberal theology was like the evil empire. And so this was a time of new orthodoxy and God is dead and all this kind of stuff. So, so Sartre, no, not Sartre, that was another, that was the existentialist. So Tillich and Bart, they were like the really bad guys and you shouldn't read them. So in the last 15 years, I've been reading all the books I was told I wasn't supposed to read. And, you know, if you're growing up a Baptist, you, you shouldn't read Catholics and, uh, you know, because, you know, they believe in Mary and all this stuff. But, but I read a book by Paul Tillich called Shaking the Foundations. And I have a quote in ancient language. But it is the most powerful 
words on grace that I have ever read by any evangelical fundamentalist writer. And this guy's supposed to be a German theologian who's leading, you know, the church astray. Uh, Hans Kuhn has written a book on Christianity, which is probably the most powerful book and analysis on the history of the church from the primitive church to our time. Uh, Brennan Manning has deeply impacted my life. Ragamuffin Gospel, he's a friend, a strange friend, <laughs> but his writing is so powerful and the words that he writes that describe his experiences as a drunken Catholic priest and how he encountered God. Robert Farrar Capon, who is probably one of my favorite writers, is Episcopalian chef. He loves cooking. So he does like these cooking books about Jesus. But in the middle of it, he does books on the parables of the kingdom, grace, and judgment. I've given this book away probably to 30 or 40 people. I gave this book away to Graham Cook about three years ago. And Graham said, this is the most powerful thing I've read in the last 15 years. And he's an Episcopal priest. It's a secret. I don't, I don't want, because see, he who has knowledge has the most power. So I need to, no, it's Robert Farrar Cape in his name. And it's called The Parables of Kingdom, Grace, and Judgment. Uh, these people have deeply impacted me. They've given me words. S.D. Gordon is a powerful, he did a whole series called Quiet Talks, and, G, and Destiny Image did a couple of these books, but Quiet Talks on Jesus. I mean, these guys are writing stuff that just blow your mind away. The power of their words that they're writing, the power of their things that they're saying. Let me, because this is all really messed up really bad, but let me find, here we go. Listen to this. This is S.D. Gordon, and his rendering of Genesis chapter 3. Millenniums in a moment, a million miles and just one step, an ocean and a drop, volumes in a word, a race and a woman, a hell of suffering and just one act, the depths of woe and a glance, the first chapter of Romans in Genesis 3, sharpest pain and just the softest touch, God mistrusted, distrusted. Satan embraced sin's door open, Eden's gate shut. That's how I wished I could write. Robert Farrar Capon, in retelling the time of the Reformation, wrote it this way. The Reformation was a time when men went blind, staggering drunk because they had discovered and the dusty basement of late medievalism, a whole cellar full of 15-year-old 200-proof grace. Bottle after bottle of pure distillate of scripture that would convince anyone that God saves us single-handed. The word of the gospel after all those centuries of believers trying to lift themselves up into heaven by worrying about the perfection of their own bootstraps certainly turned out to be a flat-out announcement that the saved were home free even before they even started. Grapes was to be drunk neat. No water, no ice, and certainly no ginger ale. Neither goodness nor badness, nor the flowers that bloom in the spring of your super silly spirituality could be allowed into the case it has to be grace alone. Brennan Manning put it this way, Jesus comes not for the super spiritual, but for the wobbly and the weak knee who know they don't have it all together and who are not too proud to accept a handout of amazing grace. And these are the men that have inspired me and impacted me. They have told me that I can reach to a higher level. 
There is things that I can experience in God. There are ways to write about it. And most of us, our creativity is dulled by religion and by tradition. And so all of our religious talk, all of our cliques, cliches, and religious codes that exist in the church prevent us from being creative and expressing the things that we have seen and heard. But the great writers have transcended religion. They have leaped out of the box. They have got off of the flat world that most of the church lives in, and they have seen that the world is round and that God is greater and bigger and wiser and more wonderful and beautiful than anything that they have ever experienced and seen before. And the revelation of Him has created a motivation for them to write and to explain the things that they have seen. The real voyage of discovery is not in seeking new places, but in seeing with new eyes. Marcy Darcy wrote a book called New Eyes for the Invisible and wrote out to the pain and the agony of having lost her husband and her child in a car accident. And in that beginning point, all that she could see was the tragedy of being left absolutely, totally alone. And she could not see anything else around her because she was blinded by grief and sorrow. But as the days began to go along, she began to walk. And God began to give her what she calls new eyes for the invisible. And she was able to see that God didn't cause those things to happen, but that God was there to be a friend who would take her by her hand and walk through her grief with her as a silent companion, but whose presence was very real and very powerful. Everything begins with a thought and an idea. And when I wrote Ancient Language, I had just come out of the seven years of, of absolute torture and torment and was beginning to see God in brand new ways. And I said, God, I don't know where to start. I, I, I don't trust any of my theology. I don't know if, if there's a trinity or Jesus only, or, you know, dispensational is a rapture, is there not a rapture, is this, I, it's like, I didn't know. All I knew was Jesus loved me, and I really loved him a whole lot. And so 15 years later, I can tell you without any shadow of doubt, my theology is still rather cloudy. And I still don't know very much. You know, it was amazing. When I was 20, I knew everything. Now in my 60s, I don't know hardly anything. But I do know that God is a creator. And that God created us in his image. And that we were created with his mind. And God told me, he said, the end of all things is found in the beginning of all things. And he took me on a journey, and this is how I explained it. 